Hello. For tonight's grisly tale, I'm going to read you a story from Fearsome Tales for Fiendish Kids. These are cautionary tales that I wrote for lovers of Squeam. Tonight's story is called Little Fingers. There is only one thing a boy loves more than his mother, and that is his thumb. Daffy Thomas's thumb was a misshapen stump sucked out of all recognition by his lick-lapping lips and powerful cheek muscles, puffy and white like a bloodless sausage, nailless and gnawed with two raised welts on the knuckle where his front teeth pressed down on the bone. Daffy was never to be seen without his thumb in his mouth. He ate with his mouth full, he worked with his mouth full, he even spoke with his mouth full, which, as you all know, is most unpolite. My name the Saint Madam, he mumbled through his bottle stop digit, which roughly translated as, I love the taste of my thumb. His mother couldn't understand a word he said. As far as she was concerned, the thumb had to go. She painted the shriveled nail with bitter aloes and dunked the meaty bit in a concoction of her own brewing, made from sheep's bile, snail's ooze and crusty scrapings from a blue bottle's legs. It made Daffod's thumb taste so disgusting that he couldn't bear to be in the same room as it, let alone suck it surreptitiously. Daffod was cured. However, Mrs Thomas's suckless success brought with it a secondary problem. Deprived of its daily slurp, Daffod's idle thumb soon became agitated and twitchy. It was bored, stuck inside Daffod's trouser pockets all day. It wanted to explore the world for itself. So Daffod's thumb started fidgeting, playing with the buttons on the TV remote control while Daffod's parents were trying to watch their favourite programme, picking Daffod's nose and flicking it at the cat, ringing the neighbour's front doorbell and then hiding behind Daffod's back. Soon, however, Daffod's fingers and non-sucking thumb became wildly jealous of the fun that the sucking thumb was having. And they joined in too, making Daffod's hands the most probing, prodding, seeking, tweaking, twitching, scratching, poking, picking, pressing, messing, wiggling, twiddling, fiddling hands in the whole of Wales. Daffod's little fingers had the devil in them. At breakfast, they drummed rhythms on the wooden table, tapped out tunes with the cutlery on the milk bottle and catapulted the teaspoon out of the sugar bowl. Daffod! scolded his mother. Look at the mess! Sit on your hands, boy! shouted his father, whose newly oiled hair was coated in a fine white cap of sugar granules. Sorry, ma'am, said Daffod, but before the words had even passed his lips, his wandering fingers were off again. Boinging the butter knife underneath his thigh, crunching the cereal in its cellophane bag to locate the free plastic glowworm, shredding the paper napkin into a thousand tiny flaky pieces. And after breakfast, while Daffod stood by the front door, waiting to go down the shops, his fingers snapped the letterbox flap up and down behind his back. Click clack, click clack, click clack, click clack, click clack, click clack, click clack. Daffod, for the love of God, will you stop that clacking now? wailed his mother. Fingers in the cake mix, fingers in the ink, fingers in the butter dish, fingers in the sink, fingers in the video, frisbeeing a hat, fingers in the hi-fi, fingers in the cat. <coughs> That is dirty, Daffod. How would you like that done to you? Oh, sorry, ma'am. I wasn't looking what I was doing. I thought it was a woolly glove. Fingers pulling loose threads out of jumpers, fingers knocking knick-knacks off a ledge, fingers plucking stuffing out of car seats, fingers stripping leaves from Dad's front hedge, fingers leaving apples down the sofa, fingers peeling paper down the wall, fingers testing meat knives for a sharp edge, bloody fingers dripping through the hall. Dafford, please, screeched his exhausted mother. But I'm dying, look you, ma'am, said her bleeding son. Well, it will serve you right for fiddling if you do. 
Daffod's little fingers were a finger-clicking nuisance, always on the sniff, always scratching, scribbling, scrunching and scraping, and always, always irritating. His parents were persecuted by them day and night, and so it was, one day, that his mother announced to Daffod that she and his father were taking a holiday on their own to escape from the fiendish finger-fiddling. "'But who will feed me?' asked Daffod pathetically. "'Your Granny Gwyneth,' said his mother. "'But she's ninety-three! exclaimed Daffod. "'She set the kitchen on fire last time she boiled an egg. "'She is also stone deaf, Daffod, "'so she won't be bothered by your fidgeting,' said his mother triumphantly. "'Then she went upstairs to pack her bags "'and ordered a cab to the airport. "'Granny Gwyneth's idea of a busy day "'was to sit in front of the television and snooze. Daffod couldn't leave the house in case she fell out of a chair or needed a digestive biscuit or her sixteenth cup of tea. He was trapped for two whole weeks babysitting the babysitter. He couldn't even have a conversation with her because she was as deaf as a post. Shall we go to the cinema today, Granny Gwyneth? he asked one morning. Oh, I don't know, young Daffod. I think Princess Di is lovely, she replied, nodding her head slowly. No, to the cinema to see a film, shouted Daffod. Lovely, croaked his orally challenged Nan. But I prefer cockles. Daffod twisted the curtain cord around his fingers and screamed a silent scream. There was a clatter from above as the curtain rail pinged out of the wall and descended on his head. Or oh, jelly deals, added Granny Gwyneth. He was always partial to a little snake in the basket. For a boy with such active fingers sitting on the sofa all day discussing woolen blankets and denture fixative was a living hell. So great was Daffod's boredom that he fidgeted with every object in the house fifteen times and wore each of them out in turn. On the fourth day of his incarceration there was only one possession of his parents left unbroken. The telephone. So he turned his hand to that lifting the receiver up and down like a tiny dumbbell to set up a rhythmical clicking, tapping tunes on the tone buttons and ringing up complete strangers with silly names. Hello, is that Mr Smelly? Yes. Who's this? You're Smelly, are you? I am. Well, I should do something about it then. And some days, while Granny Gwyneth gassed on about pet food or foreign cheeses, Daffy would just dial numbers at random to see who he got. He spoke to Buckingham Palace Kitchens and ordered anchovy souffle with custard-covered meatballs for the Queen's tea. He bought three jet fighters for the Saudi Arabian Air Force when he found himself connected to the Foreign Office. And he told a lady in Gwent that she'd just won half a tonne of manure in a gardening competition and the lorry would be round in half an hour to dump it on her doorstep. He ran up a phone bill of two and a half thousand pounds, speaking to places as far away as Australia, America and the Balearics. But not once did his granny notice. The poor old duck never heard a thing. Now then, knitting, she announced one day, leaving Daffod groaning at the thought of it. There's a fine profession for a fit young man, Daffod. Knitting cardigans and booties. Did I ever tell you I once knitted a scarf for your father? A fine garment it was, dirt brown as I recall. It shrank to the size of a sock when your mother washed it. Daffod picked up the telephone and punched in seven digits in the hope that somebody interesting might answer. It was wrong of me, I know, being a Christian lady, Daffod, but I never forgave your mother for that. Hello? said a sing-song Italian voice at the other end of the line. Hello, said Daffod. Who's that? It's a pizza mafiosa here. What do you want? A pizza, said Daffod, for want of anything better to say. Granny Gwyneth was nattering away happily to herself in the background about cross-stitching. What have you got? We, we do all sorts at Pisa Mafiosa, my friend. There's a, the meat massacre, the pepperoni punch-up, the shotgun special, and that comes with the extra novelty kneecaps on the top, if you like. We do a very nice rabbit punch, a concrete overcoat. That's a quite heavy on the stomach, that one. Then there's a kidnap caper and a chicken execution. 
with a blindfold, of course. They all come in a nice wooden box with a side order of horse's head in a garlic bed. Well, they all sound lovely, slurped Daffod. Would you recommend the kidnap keeper? Well, it, it depends, said the man. That's on our children's menu. Are you a child? Yes, I am. Well, good. Uh, you on your own? Well, apart from my granny. Is she old? Oh, very, said Daffod. Well, it's a perfect. We can deal with her. And your parents, they rich? Well, I don't know, said Daffod. They've, they've just gone on holiday, so I guess they must be. OK, one kidnap caper on its way, said the voice. Don't move. Where is you? Daffod told the man from the pizza shop where he lived, put down the phone and licked his lips. He loved pizza. He could get his fingers nice and sticky. When the doorbell rang ten minutes later, Granny Gwyneth was reminiscing about the Blitz in World War Two, one of her favourite topics of conversation. Oh, those were the days, look you, she smiled dreamily, singing songs in the shelters while the bombs burst overhead, eating powdered eggs and bully beef sandwiches. Oh, it was easier when there were rations, had no choice, see? Daffod got up off the sofa, sneaked out of the sitting room without his granny noticing, and opened the front door. Buonasera, signore, your pizza, said the delivery man who was dressed in a smart, shiny suit and was wearing dark glasses. A kidnap keeper, salivated Daffod. Oh, I can hardly wait. Where is it? The man had nothing in his hands. The van, he grunted. Now! And he produced a machine gun from behind his back. Oh, the pizza's in the van, is it? Guessed Daffod. Too big to carry on your own? Shut your mouth and come with me ordered the pizza delivery man, driving the muzzle of his gun into Daffod's ribs. Oh, whatever you say, said Daffod, setting off down the front path towards a long black limousine parked in the road. That's a very impressive vehicle, said Daffod. Most people round here deliver pizzas on clapped-out motorbikes. Business good, is it? Get in, growled the man with the gun. But Granny Gwyneth, I, I've left her talking about the war. In! barked the Italian, ducking Daffod's head through the open door and pushing him roughly across the back seat. One move and your pizza topping. So, how much is this pizza going to cost then? asked Daffod as the limousine screeched away from the curb. Everything your parents have got, smiled the man from Pizza Mafiosa. Ciao for now, bambino. Then he rifle-butted Daffod across the side of his head and knocked the muddled Welsh wealth into the middle of next week. Daffod had been kidnapped. The next day, a ransom note plopped through the letterbox, but Granny Gwyneth didn't hear it. She was still sitting where Daffod had left her when he went to the door to collect his pizza, still prattling on about the war to an empty sofa. Mind you, Daffod, the nights were terrible cold and the fuel was scarce. We used to burn rats to keep us warm, look you. So the ransom note lay unopened, which was a shame, because it read, We have got a your son, enclosed is one finger to prove it. Come to Piccadilly Circus with ten thousand pounds in cash tonight, or we'll chop off another one. The Pizza Papa. In the envelope was Daffy's little finger, stiff, cold, and white. The next day, another envelope dropped onto the doormat and was missed by Granny Gwyneth. She was still talking to herself. Did I ever tell you about the day Di died? That was a sad, sad day, Daffy. Another day, another finger. And so it continued for seven further days. Daffod's fingers posted through the door at nine o'clock every morning and sniffed by the cat, while Granny Gwyneth wallowed in nostalgia in a comfortable old armchair in the empty old lounge. The deliveries would have carried on forever, until Daffod had run out of fingers, of course, had not Mr and Mrs Thomas returned home from holiday. 
You can imagine how surprised they were to find their son's fingers on the doormat. You can imagine how surprised Granny Gwyneth was too. Well, I, I thought he was in the room with me, so I did, she cried, sitting on the sofa. Mr. Thomas paid the ransom immediately and Daffod was returned the following morning. How are you feeling, Daffod? asked his father. Well, not with my fingers, said Daffod, holding up his stumpy hands and wiggling his one remaining thumb. Still, look on the bright side, said his mother. You won't be fiddling no more, will you, Daffod? I don't expect I will, ma'am, said Daffod slipping his lonely thumb into his mouth and comforting himself with a long, soothing suck. Oh, Daffod, chided his mother. I am very disappointed in you. She slapped his wrist. I thought you'd grown out of that filthy habit, boy. Get the bitter aloes, mother, said his da. And she went upstairs to the bathroom cabinet to do as she was bid. <laughs>